So welcome back to Life Groups this semester. We're excited to get the spring semester started off. We've got just a lot of exciting things that we're going to be talking about this semester. This semester we're actually going to be going through the book of Exodus. Now the last semester we covered the life of Paul the Apostle and the semester before that we studied the book of Genesis. And so this semester I wanted us to dive into the book of Exodus and continue our journey through the Old Testament. Now last year we did do a series uh, in main service called Road Trip where we took a journey with the Israelites and some of that included the book of Exodus. It also included the book of Numbers and other things. But there was a lot that we weren't able to cover um, in that series that I really wanted to dive into in this series, the book of Exodus. Such as we didn't even talk about the plagues in that road trip. We didn't talk about the Passover. There's a lot of things that we didn't cover that I want us to be able to get into this semester. And so I'm just believing it's going to be an awesome time and just God's going to lead us and we're going to learn a lot of new things. So the book of Exodus actually begins right where the book of Genesis leaves off. You know, the book of Genesis leaves off with all these exciting things happening for the people of God. You know, Joseph and his whole family are moved to Egypt. They have a very prominent place. They're very influential. You know, they're, they're in, they've got an in with the Pharaoh, and they're very prosperous. It's just the, the book of Genesis ends like, man, these people, they really have, have it going good for them. Well, when the book of Exodus begins, that all starts to change. And so we see in Exodus chapter 1, verse 6, that's where we're going to begin. It says, Then Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. So they just continued to multiply. Remember, it started with Joseph, then his brothers, you know, which were about 11 of them or so, and their kids and families. It just Those were the ones that went down to Egypt, uh, and they just continued to multiply, you know, year after year. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramesses, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And so what began as this tremendous miracle for the people of God by being brought to Egypt and given this place of influence has turned into a horrible situation where they're actually made slaves in the land. And so this went on for generation after generation. Now not only did Pharaoh become so paranoid, you know, that he made him made them slaves and that type of thing, but he also got to the point that he was so afraid of them and he wanted to stop them from multiplying and there was nothing he could do to stop that, that he decided to actually kill all of the male children to try to stop them from multiplying. So in verse 22 it says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. It was because of this decree that we actually meet Moses in the book of Exodus because his mother and sister, his family, they were godly. They didn't want, of course, lose their son Moses and so they made this plan to put him in a basket and they put him in the Nile to try to rescue him. It's just kind of a last ditch effort to try to save his life, but thank God that he was preserved by the power and the provision of God. When he's put in the Nile by his sister Miriam, She's kind of watching him, you know, flow down the Nile and following him through the reeds. And it just so happens that right where he was at, that Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the river with her servants to bathe. We get this in Exodus chapter 2, verse 5. It says, Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And while her young women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. Now look at how God is already orchestrating these events. This is a complete coincidence you would think 
you know, if you were observing it. They put Moses in the in the Nile, and Miriam's just watching him go down the river to see what's going to happen. And at that exact moment, Pharaoh's daughter comes down with her servants down to the river, and she sees the basket. So God's just orchestrating these events. He's causing this to, to happen. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister, which was Miriam, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. This is an amazing turn of events because uh, Miriam and her mother, they put Moses in the river. He gets found by Pharaoh's daughter. Miriam runs up to her and says, You know, okay, hey, you found this Hebrew boy. Should I go find one of the Israelite women to, to nurse him for you? She says, yes. Well, naturally, she just goes and gets her mother. And then notice that she's paid by Pharaoh wages to nurse this baby for her. Well, actually, it's, it's her own son, Moses. And so she's being paid to take care of her own son. So God just totally made this into an awesome situation for them, which it would have been a tragedy, but God was working something powerful behind the scenes. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. So Moses grows up in the house of Pharaoh, which I've often thought about this when I've read it, how he must have felt. You know, he's, he's growing up in the house of Pharaoh, wealth, riches, servants, power, influence, authority, all the things that would come with growing up in Pharaoh's household. And yet his relatives, including his own family, you know, uh, Miriam, his mother, his brother Aaron, they are all slaves, you know, and he's growing up in that household observing that he knows his, his heritage. He knows he's a Hebrew. The people of the of Pharaoh's house know he's a Hebrew, and yet he's growing up in this house. And so he, he grows up, but there's something in him that's stirring. He knows that what's being done to his people is not right. And so in verse 11 of chapter 2, it says, One day when Moses had grown up, which we find out later that he was 40 years old at this point. So he had been in, he had been in the house of Pharaoh for 40 years. They were like his own family. When Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. You get the feeling that this was very premeditated, even beyond what we're reading right here. You get the feeling that this was something he had thought about many times as he would look out and, and saw how his people were being treated, that he had thought about this, this act of murder. But even if he hadn't premeditated it before this moment, the fact that it says he looked this way and that, he had time to think about it. It was premeditated and just in a moment of anger he struck this Egyptian down and says that he hit him in the sand. Well, a few days later, uh, two Hebrew slaves are fighting amongst themselves and Moses intervenes and one of them looks at him and says, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? And you can imagine the terror that just struck Moses' heart because he thought he had done that in secret. He didn't realize anyone had observed him doing that. So you can imagine the dread that hit his heart when he realized, oh my gosh, this is not a secret, what I have done. And all the repercussions just started rushing through his mind of what that would mean. Verse 15 says, When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So Moses flees. You know, once, once he realizes that he's found out it's not a secret, he, he takes off. He's out of there, and he, he flees to the land of Midian. One of the interesting facts about Midian, where Moses fled, was that it's about 250 miles from Egypt, and he actually had to pass through the exact same wilderness that 40 years from now he would be leading all the children of Israel through again. Of course, he didn't know that at the time. He would have literally passed right by Mount Sinai in this journey to Midian, not knowing 
that in 40 years from now, he's going to be leading, you know, over a million people through this exact same journey that he's taken through the wilderness now. So for the next 40 years, Moses is in Midian. He meets Jethro, you know, a shepherd from the area. He ends up marrying Jethro's daughter, Zipporah. He has a family, has children of his own, and he becomes a shepherd. And at this point, he's 80 years old. Now think about how he must have felt about his life at this point. He starts in Pharaoh's household. He's raised in luxury, riches, influence. He makes this awful mistake. He flees as an outlaw, you know, 250 miles away, meets this shepherd guy in the desert, marries his daughter, has a family, and just basically he's watching sheep for the next 40 years. He's 80 years old at this point. Now, how can you feel, if you're Moses, how would you feel about your life? You know, because I know that he, there's no way he ever stopped thinking about his, his family members and his, his uh, relatives that were still slaves. And here he is, escaped from all of that. You know, first he was raised in luxury, never a slave himself. Now he's out in Midian, raising a family, living the easy life, being a shepherd, you know, not really doing much, not really accomplishing much with his life, just kind of, you know, living chilled out in the, in the desert, watching sheep, hanging out with Jethro. And how does he feel about his life? You know, I would think... In Moses' mind, he felt like a failure. He felt like a coward, probably, that he had left, abandoned everything, you know. He, he had to have some guilt that he had somehow escaped all of this, and now he's just in the, in the desert living. He's 80 years old, you know, what's left of my life at this point, you know. And so he's just kind of in that retirement mentality, I would think. You know, he's got some regrets, trying to look at his legacy, what, what's going on here. This is not even a midlife crisis. This is like an end of life. A reflection that he would be having going you know what have I accomplished what have I done here and you know at this point I'm 80 and so God's done with me God's through with me what else is there for me you know at 80 and yes people live slightly longer than but Moses only lived to be like 120 so you know he doesn't have like a lot of years left 80 was still 80 you know at that point so around this time in Exodus chapter 3 it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll turn aside to see this great sight while this bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said to him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Now, you got to... We read this story and we think, Yeah, Moses didn't want to do it. Well, my gosh, I mean, no wonder he didn't do it. You have to imagine, you got to put yourself in his situation, okay? He's talking about Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world as far as wealth, riches, military power, it would be like God coming to you today and saying, I want you to come against the United States of America. It's like, you know, you can just imagine what in the world, what chance am I going to stand against the United States of America? Yeah, I got a shotgun in the closet, but they've got tanks and planes and military. It's, it's equivalent to that. 
You know, Moses is thinking, this is ridiculous. And not only that, I'm 80. Not only that, I don't like to talk, you know, in front of people. It just, I seem like the worst choice for this ever. But God had something very powerful in mind of how he was going to do this. So God said to Moses, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain, which he was right near Mount Sinai. So Moses argues with God a little bit more, but eventually God tells him, no, you're doing this. I'll be with you. I'm going to send you Aaron. I'm going to give you a magical staff that turns into snakes and stuff like that, but you're doing this. So he agrees, and after that, Moses ends up taking on the most impossible task that has probably ever been undertaken in the history of mankind. It's literally man versus army. Moses versus Egypt, except he's got God on his side. And that's where we're going to pick up next week when he brings his trek back into Egypt and the Exodus begins. Mm -hmm.